Um, good conversations start when you ask a great question and you get the other person talking. Starting a conversation can be difficult. Is that very often poor performing teams just don't talk to each other frequently enough. Hello, this is your host, Ling Ling. I'm also the director of Spark Learning Solutions, a learning and development company that supports development of intercultural competence for leaders and organizations globally. You are listening to the Leaders of Learning podcast, a podcast that explores learning in the 21st century with educators, entrepreneurs, and thought leaders from around the world. Having a conversation fulfills a basic human need to connect, also to belong, to share, to grow, and much more. Conversing is a skill we have been practicing over our entire lifetime, yet many times we take it for granted. Words spoken can have so much power. It can lift spirits or crush them. It can raise hope and instill inspiration. Yet it can also destroy dreams and foster fear and negativity. So how can we ensure that our conversations help others to transform? To help us answer this question, joining us is Don Rappi, co-founder of the company Transform Your Conversations. So welcome, Don. Well, thank you, Ling Ling. It's a great pleasure to be on the podcast. Good to have you here with us today. So tell us your story. How did you end up leading a company that advocates for good quality conversations? Okay, so that's an interesting question. So I've always lived and worked in international and multicultural environments. And my early career, before I went into learning and development and started my own training company, um, was spent between the United Kingdom and Holland, which is where my mother's family came from. And uh, my early career was in the retail business, and I held a number of senior leadership positions in the store operations part, developing the subsidiaries for that retailer in France, Belgium, Spain, and Southern Ireland. Um, and that journey took me to work in uh, very challenging environments. And when I got the opportunity to move into uh, into learning and development, when the retail business went went bankrupt, I'd always had a strong interest in helping people to learn. And I went into the training business and started uh, very quickly expanding my horizons to uh, work on team effectiveness and leadership development. And I've been really fortunate to work across five countries, sorry, five continents, <laughs> um, over 30 countries, because that's where I think I can leverage my business experience and my understanding of different cultures. And um, I've always had my own training business. And very recently, the company that I talked to you about, TYC, Transform Your Conversations, uh, I created that with my partner, Elizabeth, because we had a profound belief that leadership development is all around conversations. And yeah, you know the part of that story, but it's a very, uh, very important part of relationships that managers have with their direct reports, with their stakeholders, uh, with anybody in general. It's their ability to engage and align and build trust through great conversations. So that's how I got to where I am today. Fantastic. Uh, so to me, a conversation is where, you know, like you mentioned, two people get together, they hold a dialogue and there's an outcome to it, and there's a discussion or a topic in that conversation. So to you, what is the difference between an ordinary conversation and what you do is a transformative conversation? So I think, yeah, transformation, it's an interesting word. It's a very powerful word, and the, my take on that is that uh, transformative conversations are conversations that change your perspective. And really conversations that, that make that change and allow for that transformation are where you as an individual who's participating gets a deeper understanding um, and is able to understand somebody else's point of view. Um, conversation is not just a one-way process, it's very much a dialogue between two people. And yeah, the skills that you need, and we'll talk about that no doubt later on, but the skills that you need are um, to be able to engage the other person to explore their perspective and your own 
uh, your own insights come from listening and from questioning and from probing and getting new insights from the person that's, that you're having the conversation with. So it's very much a, a partnership. You can have a conversation. I'm sure you've had conversations with people which are very superficial and they don't lead anywhere. Uh, but a transformative conversation is where you get real insights from talking something through with a partner. So you've mentioned a few things already. It's a, a transformative conversation. It's a dialogue. One gets insight. Uh, one needs to listen. What are the other important elements that make up a transformative conversation? You know, when I think of the uh, the type of conversations that the more formal type of conversations that you can have in an organization, for instance, um, a conversation around giving feedback or a coaching conversation or a conversation to discuss somebody's performance. I mean, there are many, many examples where in organizations you need to sit down and you need to talk to people. Um, so I think some of the key things are around the structure of those conversations. They don't happen by accident. I think as the maybe the initiator of those conversations, um, you need to have a clear idea about what you're trying to achieve. You need to be able to uh, set and agree the guidelines with your partner about how long we've got, and what are we going to cover? Um, so simple things like that really do make conversations very much more effective. Um, and I also think that you've got to be able to ask great questions. For me, that's probably one of the key skills. Um, good conversations start when you ask a great question and you get the other person talking. Um, so I'll just give you a, a simple example. If you say to somebody, have you done this? That's a typical question that a manager asks their direct report. They're checking up the status of something. Um, have you done this or have you done that? Well, you'll probably get a yes or a no answer. But if the question changes to tell me what you've done, it's a completely different dimension of the question. And you can start opening up the, the, the dialogue. You have no idea what the person's going to say. There's lots of things that could emerge from that conversation that you can hook onto and reformulate and explore. So... For me, that, uh, that power of simple, open, probing questions is the key to great conversations. What do you think are some of the common mistakes when engaging in a conversation? What I see very often is that people don't listen. I think uh, people are very often um, willing to go into a conversation. They've got something to say. And when the conversation starts, they're not really focusing, they're not really tuning into what the other person is saying, and they're waiting for the opportunity for the other person to stop talking and for them to chip in. And when I'm in conversations with people like that, I can spot that straight away. I know when we're starting to create a connection. So I think that's one of the biggest errors I see. Um, it's probably one of intention. Somebody who starts a conversation who they don't really have time to commit to uh, a deep conversation. That's a big mistake. Uh, somebody comes to uh, to approach you and say, you know, can we talk? Um, you might say, yeah, sure, come in. Or, yeah, let's go and have a few minutes. But you haven't really got a few minutes. So you've got something else on your agenda, something else on your mind. You get distracted and you can't focus your attention on that person. So for me, that's the biggest mistake, the intention that you have needs to be positive and you need to be focused on understanding what the other person's got to say. The second, the second common mistake I see is uh, comes from a lack of understanding of what listening is. They, the prime purpose of listening is to understand the perspective of the other person. And pe off, very often people make uh, very basic mistakes like not reformulating or reflecting back on what they've heard. They can let a conversation go on for seven, several minutes and not check out that they've understood what their partner's saying. So if somebody says something to me, uh, they're talking to me, for instance, if, uh, if I was talking to you and you've reformulated, uh, you'd say to me, so Don, let me just see if I've got a, uh, a correct handle in this. What you're telling me is that uh, a lot of people go into conversations without really having the necessary skills. If you said that to me, Ling Ling, I'd say, yes, absolutely. That's exactly what I was trying to say. And we would move on to the next level. But what you would have done successfully there is you would have shown me that you're really listening. You would have shown me that you've got the gist of what I'm saying. Um, and we can move on to another level. The mistake that people often make by not reformulating is that you could be talking or I could be talking 
and we're not really on the same wavelength. So for me, being able to reformulate, uh, to collect your energy, to, um, to move on to the next level is really important. Otherwise, the conversation loses track. The third mistake I see very often when I'm in conversations with people is talking too much. Um, I think it's uh, really important that you allow your partner to explore their own ideas and they can only really explore their own ideas by thinking it through and if you're receptive, if you're focused, if you're really intent on helping them to tell their side of the story, uh, it's a really powerful, it's a really powerful thing and people often make the mistake that they don't allow somebody to, uh, to, to explore their own thoughts. The other mistake I see is when people interrupt in a conversation. It's very easy to do that. Sometimes people are losing track in a conversation, but when you interrupt somebody's train of thought, you're showing them that your train of thought is more important. It shows them that, uh, that you're trying to take control of the conversation, so I think that's a, a mistake people commonly make. Uh, they need to just let it go. They need to let the person talk and um, it's amazing what will come out of a conversation if you let the other person's uh, flow of thoughts go. So that's my take on that. Yeah, a lot of things people need to be careful of. We spoke about the elements of a good conversation as well as common mistakes. But how does a good conversation happen within a team environment? Can you share that with us? You know, when, you, when managers or leaders are working with teams... Um, I think it's really important that they devote sufficient time to have powerful and transforming conversations with their teams. Um, I know from my experience of working with teams, some of whom are poor performers, uh, that's why they come to work with us, um, but also from working with very high performing teams, is that very often poor performing teams just don't talk to each other frequently enough. They're very focused on the task and they are generally, they're unclear about so many things that are part of their mission. They're unclear on goals. I was working with the team recently um, and it was quite, uh, quite concerning to hear the diversity of opinion about what it is that we're trying to achieve as a team. Uh, what are the roles and what are the accountabilities of each one of us? And you could, you could sense in that team that there was not the level of trust and understanding that great teams actually have. And I think that comes down to a lack of time talking to each other. Um, and one of the things that we do in our organization with teams is to help, uh, to help them to facilitate these type of conversations. It's really important for teams to be able to reflect on how they're doing and to be able to contribute to a conversation where they can share their feedback on what is working well in the team and to also to be able to provide insights into what they would like to improve or to do differently. Now typically, um, a team that isn't devoting time to that, they'll say, has anybody got any comments or has anybody got any suggestions? And you might see one or two vocal people, one or two extroverts, say, saying, yes, I think we should do this, or uh, the conversation is, is generally dominated by those people who habitually speak up, and the result is a very, very poor input into um, an assessment of how the team is doing and how the team could improve their performance. So what we do with teams that are performing like that is that we give them the opportunity to reflect individually. Um, everybody's got a point of view, but you have to be able to facilitate that. And when you've got, let's say, eight or ten people in a team, you need to be able to give everybody in the team the opportunity to answer to that. So the key here is to prepare the questions. And I think I mentioned that earlier on. Preparation and process are really important. So in team conversations, for instance, uh, you need to allow a team ten minutes or so before this type of session and say to them, before we go into this round-the-table forum, Think about what it is that is really working well on a project, with a task, in the team more generally. What is it that you would like to see improved, changed, or done differently? And then every single person in turn would go round the table. And it is amazing what happens after not just the first round, but the second round. And when a team does that regularly, they get used to expressing an opinion in a neutral and non-judgmental way. 
and they get used to the idea that actually everybody in the team has got a point of view. I did this recently with a team where the people who were giving the most uh, powerful insights into the way the team was performing were a couple of the introverted people who didn't normally speak out. And it was because the, the opportunity for them to join in the conversation was facilitated by the process. So that's a good example of process helping uh, a team to, uh, to have more productive conversations. Oh, wow. It sounds like the process of facilitated conversations helps a team to become a better team, a more high-performing team, and a one that learns from each other uh, and shares with each other what's going on Absolutely. in the team itself. What is it about conversations that help someone uh, learn, that help someone to become a better person? Well, I think it's the insights. You know, nobody learned anything by giving a pitch or by making a statement. You know, learning comes from other people. It comes through insights. It comes through action and reflection. Everything we know about learning um, is learning through experience. And I think conversations are really powerful. If you go into a conversation with that intent that I talked about earlier on, that you are going to learn something, uh, it's amazing what can come out. So that's what we that's what we talk about all the time in our leadership programs and in our conversation programs. You have to be open to that. You have to understand that in every conversation there could be a very positive outcome, provided you go and dig a, dig deeper and search for it. There are certain people who are introverted, who are extroverted, and the way they approach conversations uh, can be different. So I'd imagine if you are an extroverted person. Starting a conversation can be difficult, and even if you know they ha have established a relationship with someone. So what are the ways that an introverted person can approach a conversation so that it'll be easier for them to start? Yes, you're right. I think introverted people or people with a preference for introversion are less comfortable with initiating conversations, particularly in a large group format. I don't think that they're necessarily any less skilled in conversation, and typically introverts are very, very good in a one-on-one -on -one situation or a small group setting. But I think to initiate conversation and to um, and to come out of themselves when typically they can be quite reserved is a challenge for them. And very often when I'm facilitating sessions uh, around the Myers-Briggs type indicator or uh, we're exploring introversion, extroversion in a, in a leadership forum. Uh, the introverts are very open and they say, look, we find that difficult. You know, people view us as being shy. Um, that's very often interpreted by the extroverts as being uh, unsociable, which, of course, it's absolutely not about sociability. And they're often regarded as being people who don't have a contribution to make. So I think all of that, that's a perception that is very deep rooted. If you go to a typical business meeting and it's not structured in the right way to allow everybody to talk, you'll see and hear the extroverts contributing and the introverts are focusing on what's going on. They're intent on um, analyzing what is being said. And, you know, the things are clearly going on in their mind. They're not visible in the way that they are to extroverts. Um, and probably there are many, many ideas that could come from the introverts, but they don't get the opportunity to talk. So I think it's a big barrier for introverts to initiate conversations. Um, and I think, I think they, need, they need process. One of the things that we do in our conversation programs is to uh, facilitate that process of joining in the conversations. And... What I often say to them is it's not about you pitching. You don't have to present yourself. You don't have to necessarily make a, a speech. But to be able to join in the conversation by reformulating what you've heard, I think for an introvert is a very, really powerful thing. So imagine yourself in a business setting in a meeting. Um, if you want to develop your skills in conversations, for instance, uh, or if you want to be able to develop your confidence, you can not stop the conversation, but you can join in just by doing what you did very well earlier on, Ling Ling, which is to say, can I just reformulate what I've heard? If you're in a one-on-one -on -one conversation with somebody um, and your preference is for introversion, um, you can ask, you can go into that conversation with some very simple questions like checking out with the other person, so tell me where you're from, or 
could you tell me you know what exactly it is that you do there are some very simple questions that introverts can ask that will get the conversation going but will focus immediately on getting the other person to talk about themselves or about the issue which of course is much easier for an introvert to to handle but they need a good question to start so my advice to introverts is always have a have a few good questions in your pocket that you can use to start a conversation going get the other person talking and then there'll be a wealth of things that you can bring your own skills to which is digging deeper showing a genuine interest in the other person picking up on one or two of the things that they've said and i find that um introverts do that very well you've mentioned earlier on about how uh if a conversation for an introvert is facilitated and there's a process for them there'll be uh it'll be easier for them to get into a conversation but let's say if they don't have a, a structured process for them to get into a conversation. And this conversation is, of course, uh, dominated by extroverts, people who, who talk, um, who just keep talking, you know. Um, and these are typically associated to, to extroverts. So as an extroverted person, you know, what aspects of a conversation do they have to be aware of? Yeah, I think extroverts can be... Um, can be great in conversations. Very often they are they're driving the energy in a conversation. Sometimes they can be uh, very resourceful and inventive. Uh, extroverts can be curious and they can be very entertaining as well. And I think extroverts need to be very conscious of the impact that they have on other people. I think extroverts need to be very careful that the focus of the conversation is not on them. And uh, my, my biggest tip to extroverts is to shut up and listen <laughs> and, um, and make a real effort in your next conversations to find out more about your partner. And it's amazing what can come out of that. And I think you've got to be really willing to um, understand the potential negative impact of you doing all the talking. You, you, you can't assume that the other person is not talking because they're shy or they don't have anything, have anything to say. It could well be that they know you're an extrovert or you're doing all the talking and they're just leaving room for you. So make an effort to talk less, ask open probing questions. It's the same advice I would give for introverts. Ask open probing questions and really see if you can find out what's going on with your partner. I think that's the key to, to conversations. You've got to let the other person do the talking. Well, that's, uh, those are really good tips for both introverts and extroverts when it comes to having good quality conversations. So make sure you ask probing questions, you take the time to listen and to listen genuinely. But right now we're living in an increasingly diverse society where we, we may have conversations with someone from a completely different background. Like uh, say, for example, that I need to approach a client or a stakeholder that is of a different culture than I am. And I know that cross-cultural communication especially can be very challenging. So in a situation like this, what is the best approach that I can take in order to approach someone who's from a different culture than I am? Well, that's a great question. Uh, it's one of the most challenging things that I find uh, that anybody has to face when they are conversing in English, when English is not their mother tongue. It's the international business language, and I see that there's a huge amount of misunderstanding and frustration that can come from these types of conversations. Sometimes people don't have the confidence or the right words to say what they mean at the right moment in a conversation. And if you're approaching a conversation, let's say that um, you're approaching somebody who comes from a very, very different background, it's likely that their English if the conversation is going to be happening in English, which it's very likely that it will be, their level of English may not be quite as good as your own level of English. That can lead to quite a stressful experience from, uh, from the other person's side. So these are very, very common situations and can lead often to the misunderstanding that I was talking about. So my recommendation always when it comes to this type of conversation is to recognize that this is likely to happen. I think you have to be you have to be very humble when it comes to this type of conversation. You need to understand that if your level of English proficiency, for instance, is very high, that you need to make allowances for that. You need to make 
the conversation easy access for the other person. So two or three good tips here are to speak slowly and clearly and to articulate. Remember that it's very much easier for somebody to understand what you're saying if they can see that you are focused on them and that you are looking at them and that you are speaking slowly. And very often some of that misunderstanding happens because you assume that the other person's got the same language ability as you and they miss half of what you're saying. So it's really important for them to be able to join in the conversation to understand exactly what it is that you're talking about. So that's the first thing. Speak slowly, articulate. The second thing is to be really clear and simple in your questions. If you're going to engage in a conversation with somebody that you don't know, that comes from a different culture, you have to get them talking. And a suggestion would be that you ask them an easy access question when you start off the conversation. And I've seen examples where uh, people are unconscious of that uh, problem and they start off a conversation by making a very long uh, speech about themselves or their organization and it's really difficult to join in when something like that has just happened so keep it simple ask a really simple question of the other person so that they can get talking I think you need to create trust and you need to make a connection with people who come from a different culture and from a different language and if they feel that they can join in the conversation with you if they feel that they can trust you that you know that they're allowed to make a mistake with their English, the conversation will be much, much more powerful. So those are a couple of tips that I would give to people. Yeah, take it easy. Make it easy for the other person to, to join in the conversation. Do you have any parting advice for our listeners about transforming their conversation? Yeah, I think the, the key to this is good listening. Um, I think the... The next time you go into a conversation, I would encourage you to listen more and talk less. And when you've had the conversation, just reflect on what you've learned. What new perspectives have you got from that conversation? What are your takeaways? Just those two simple things that might help you to, uh, to improve the quality of your conversations, not just from your perspective, but from your partner's perspective as well. Excellent. So how can our listeners reach out to you if they want to? So we have, um, we have a website, which is www.conversations.com.sg. Uh, and you can contact me or my partner, Elizabeth, through the website. And all of our contact details are on there. And we'd be happy to talk to anybody who wants to explore conversations with us. Thank you very much for your time, Don. And thank you, Ling Ling, very much. That was Don Rockley, co-founder of the company Transforming Your Conversations. We spoke about how to ensure that your conversations help others to be a better person. In our next episode, we will be exploring the importance of unlearning and the dangers of holding on to outmoded concepts. Joining us is Faiza Hamid, head of the Singapore Red Cross Academy. She will also provide a humanitarian perspective on the topic of unlearning. If you enjoyed this podcast series, remember to share this with your friends or colleagues who might benefit from this. When you have the time, please subscribe, rate, and review us on the podcast platform you are currently listening to. This is your host, Ling Ling. Thank you for listening to the Leaders of Learning podcast.